Welcome to this special edition of Answer Time, the discussion show from Reaction. I'm uh, Ian Martin, editor and publisher of Reaction. Now, Answer Time, uh, I'm very pleased to say, is in association with NatWest Group this evening uh, in support of our student program at Reaction. Welcome to the students and pupils who are joining us this evening, if this is your, your first uh, event with Reaction. Thank you. Subscription to Reaction is free for students and pupils, actually for anyone under the age of uh, 23. And the details are on the website, but we will also uh, send you an email later. Sign up, you get my weekly newsletter on sort of geopolitics and um, the world and news and all that sort of stuff. Maggie's brilliant journalism and our fantastic uh, work of our fantastic uh, young team. Now, our panel this evening for a special edition on vaccines and science. It's been, let's face it, well, it's been a tough few months and it's been a tough uh, 12 months, but with vaccines, there is good news. And someone who was central to that effort in the UK uh, has been Kate Bingham. Delighted uh, that Kate's joining us this evening, former chair of the UK Vaccines Task Force. Professor Brian Cox, known to you all, uh, great uh, friend of uh, Reaction and a Reaction subscriber, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad to say. Welcome, Maggie Pagano, my colleague uh, uh, and executive editor of Reaction, and to Sebastian Burnside, who's chief economist of NatWest Group. We've been absolutely inundated with, uh, with good questions, more than any uh, event we've ever held before, I think. You can also contact us uh, during the event. Um, I think they will probably pop up, Seb, in your, um, in your uh, chat function, because you are now the host after Brian performed the most extraordinary Zoom rescue uh, program. Um, but first off, I'm gonna go to Kate Bingham and ask really, where are we as of now on the vaccination program? Um, thank you, Ian, and, and thank you for having me. So the, the rollout of vaccines is not my domain. So that is the uh, Department of Health that is responsible for actually sticking uh, needles into arms. But as far as um, supply of vaccines is concerned, which was one of my key goals, um, it's way beyond what we imagined. So if I take you all back to May last year, what when the Prime Minister asked me to take this on, the uh, position then was that there had been no vaccine ever developed against any human coronavirus. So we were starting with a blank sheet of paper, uh, which was quite daunting. And so our approach was basically to divide up the landscape of vaccine candidates into the different types of formats, so, so different ways of inducing an immune response, and then picking basically the best candidates in each of those different types of vaccine, such that we could maximize our chance to actually um, have one that worked. And um, so where are we now? Well, actually of the seven vaccines um, we, um, we supported, uh, three have been approved and two more have just released positive phase three data. So it's, it's, it's far uh, more um, advanced than I was expecting. And again, the idea that we're approaching 10 million uh, vaccinated, you know, within a year or so of actually even knowing what this SARS-CoV-2 was, I think is phenomenal. And it's a massive tribute to uh, the global team of people, whether they're the scientists, the clinicians, the patient volunteers, the manufacturing experts, everybody who's been involved. Um, and of course my team, which was um, spectacularly good. So I'm the mouthpiece, but it's the team that is uh, ones that need to deserve the credit. Now, I know that uh, Brian, Maggie and Seb will all have be dying to ask their own questions of you as well. So if at, if at any point, if the other three panelists, if you want to want to jump in, in fact, I'll come to you, Maggie, you had a, you had a great Quest, a great uh, journalistic um, question to ask Kate. Yes, Kate, it follows on from what you just said. The first day that you started in the job, and I presume you were working from home, it was locked down, with a piece of paper, what did you actually do? Did you, how did you start? As you said, no vaccine has ever been devised. So what was your starting point? Um, the first thing was to build a team. 
So what my, my life over the last 30 years has been to build companies and based on emerging or breaking science to develop therapeutics. And uh, you can only do that with people that are expert and creative and um, high energy, all of those things. So my first task was to actually start trying to assemble the team to, to do this um, with me. So the rest of the, the, the steering group of the vaccine task force um, and Clive Dix, who has taken over as chair from me, um, uh, was a very early call because Clive is brilliant and understands vaccines. He's a serial entrepreneur who started who started his life in big pharma, um, ending up running research um, for Glaxo Welcome as they then were. So team building was was critical. Um, as well as a very quick assessment of the landscape, because this wasn't a an industry I knew well. If you'd asked me, you know, specific things about immuno-oncology or, you know, dementia drugs or something like that, I would know a lot more about it. So it was actually getting up to speed very quickly, building the team, and then um, also getting a sense from those who really are expert, uh, all the rest of what's going on in the landscape. So just trying to figure out what was going on internationally, um, in terms of CEPI. Um, so that's again a new organization specifically and focused on pandemic preparedness. Uh, what was going on um, in the US? What was going on around the world? Because the goal of securing vaccines for the UK, I didn't mind where they came from. I wanted to make sure that we had the very best vaccines. Um, and that we did that quite quickly. So probably within um, a few weeks we we had had narrowed it down to a long list of ones we were really going to drill into and do work on um so, but it without the team you're nowhere so did you feel confident from the start or or when when did you when did you think this is coming together uh, well when i first got called i was originally called by matt hancock and i absolutely was not confident and i uh said that this wasn't my area and i wasn't sure i was the right person and there would be much better people than me and and that I would call him back the following day. Uh, and it's as has been reported on in the press, um, when I said that to my daughter, she had absolute heart failure and told me off and said, you can't, you've been saying that to me all my life. I can't believe you're saying you can't do it. Just get on with it. And um, it's no, it's massively daunting because to start off with, with something that you know no one has ever done before, vaccines had been attempted to be developed against SARS-1 and MERS. And that had not been successful. And that is a daunting place to be, to, just to start. Um, and so that was one of the things that um, Chris Whitty then said to me, as well as, as well as the PM, was we want to be able to stop people from dying. And so it may not be the perfect vaccine on day one, but we need to, 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 we need to reduce severe disease and stop death. And so uh, that didn't necessarily help hugely but it just meant we didn't have to be perfect on day one what mattered was speed rather than perfection i think if i, if I could just make a, a comment and maybe kay could comment as well i chaired a, a discussion last week at the royal society on this actually one of the experts said that if you look at the the pfizer technology for example which is the mrna technology um he said that he felt that if it hadn't been for this investment that technology would have been 10 years away the vaccine development and it's the, you know, of the many technologies that have been developed, that's one that seems to be potentially very useful in being very fast in that you, you, you can see a mutation, you sequence it. And he said, we're almost at a level, it's almost like 3D printing, where you can almost, you can sequence the thing and then modify the vaccine almost overnight with that technology. I think that's exactly right. So, I mean, it's awful to talk about the good things that have come out of the pandemic, but actually um, accelerated validation of platforms um, is definitely one of them. So I completely echo and agree with that. And the mRNA vaccines are far from perfect. They need cold chains, they're complex to make. Um, they're actually still complicated to, to administer. So we need to improve them. And um, But actually to get them at this scale working as well as they are. And of course, we don't yet know about durability. Um, but I think that is completely true that that has accelerated the validation of of this technology, which is which is fantastic. And so again, the most advanced vaccines were the adenoviral vaccines, which is the Oxford um, AZ vaccine, as well as the Janssen vaccine, um, as well as mRNA. Now, neither of those, when we were looking at them in May, 
no vaccine had ever been, or no product had ever been approved using those technologies. Um, j and did get their um, ADNO platform approved for the Ebola vaccine, but that was only last year. So uh, we, was, we were, not only were we facing a virus and a class of viruses where there had never been a vaccine developed ever, but we were pursuing it with two vaccine formats, which equally had never been approved. Yeah. So we were, we were ladling on the risk, which is why we then um, included as a sort of a bookend, the less sexy um, va vaccine formats, which uh, are much better understood. So the adjuvanted protein vaccine. So this is where you take a small protein or peptide of the, the viral protein and you add, include an adjuvant, which is the equivalent of having a cup of coffee to wake up the immune system. And that's, that's your vaccine but they, they're a bit slower to develop. Um, so we, we, we bought some of those vaccines and also whole virus-based vaccines, incredibly unsexy. Um, uh, uh, those of you who remember, you know, Louis Pasteur and rabies is literally you take the virus itself, you render it inactive, you also add an adjuvant to, to wake up the immune system and that is your vaccine. So these were our bookends of the ones that if it was going to be possible to find a vaccine against uh, SARS-CoV-2, it was likely that we would have a good shot, certainly with the whole virus, because that gives you all the full real estate of the protein um, uh, within the virus. So, but they were slower to develop. So that's how we had to balance sort of risk above uh, upon risk of the early vaccines. But if it worked, that was quick and nimble. And then, and then backstop it with the with the more traditional vaccine format. But then you're de you're dealing, Kate, with um, hundreds of projects going on around the world. Lots of people trying to develop stuff at at speed. How do you and your team pick the right ones? You described there, but some picking, giving giving Britain some options, really, as you said, you know, some some fallbacks. But even having said that. You know, out of whether it was 200 credible projects or 60 globally, depending on 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 who you believe, that that was a, that's a hell of a choice to have to make. Yeah, but actually, it is not as rocket science as you think of it as it sounds. Because if the goal is to get vaccines quickly, um, anything that's going to take, um, for example, if it wasn't going to get approved till the end of um, 2021, we 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 cut it off immediately. We were, so we were focused on the most advanced vaccines first um, and the ones that we felt had the strongest data. So actually we were able to slim it down quite quickly and we re diligenced, uh, I think in some detail, 20 something in, in some detail and then ended up selecting. And that people have always said, so, you know, what happens if you chose the wrong one? Well, we, we, we definitely made judgments based on the data um, that we saw. And actually, if you get the world's best brains, and, and frankly, the team that we had assembled did include the world's best brains, you know, you can only make decisions as good as the data that you've got. And uh, I'm pleased, you know, of course, it involves some luck. You can never do any of these things if there wasn't some element of luck. But it has it has worked out well. Um, and, and of course, the things we wanted to do, which I think we'll need to, to feed into the next gen vaccines, which is improved formats. So all of these are injectables, all but Janssen are two doses. Um, and we need to really think about how can you get vaccines that are easier to distribute and administer? Certainly not good for global health to have a minus 70 degree cold chain um, if you're trying to go into low income countries. So this is the idea, as I, as I think Simon Stevens, who, who runs the NHS said, you, you can envisage a time where it's maybe next year, it's combined with a, with a flu vaccine. Or yeah, I mean, so if you take Novavax, I mean, that's a multivalent um, protein antigen vaccine. Um, certainly not impossible to think that one of those uh, vaccine, one of those um, antigens is a uh, protein, or is, is flu, and then others would be um, the coronavirus. So we, of course, we don't want to have at the moment, People uh, receiving, certainly the, the cohorts at the moment, will have gone in three times, one for their flu shot and two times for their um, coronavirus shots. That is not acceptable and it's too expensive and complicated and um, disruptive. So it's got to get down ultimately to one shot and ideally not even a shot, something that, you know, you could, 
take a, take a pill or something under the tongue or a patch or anything that is more distributable. So I'm just in a in a moment, I'm going to ask Seb about the the economic impact of of, of, of vaccines and being able to vaccinate uh, early. But there's a lot of conversation at the moment about mutations and about tweaking vaccines. Can you can you describe just how does that how does that work? What's the, what is the process? And is, is it it's scientists hunting for you know geno uh, you know geno, uh, genomic uh, scientists hunting for new variations, trying to track them down, and then giving the information to the um, to the farmer people, and them sort of tweak, tweaking the vaccine and testing it and hoping that it that it matches the new variation. Is that in, in my layman's terms? Is that is that fair enough? Yeah, I mean, the UK sequences more um, strains of this coronavirus than the rest of the world put together. So we have a phenomenal surveillance uh, that is uh, the Genomics Consortium, and they've done a, a beautiful job. So the answer is we can identify these um, strains very quickly um, and, and know which are the ones that are really starting to penetrate um, dramatically. Um, the, re the, the, the real question for this coming winter, so winter of 21, is which will be the predominant strains then? And that's much like how, how we handle flu. So the, I don't even know who makes the decisions, but there will be a decision as to which of the key flu strains are going to be incorporated into flu vaccines each, each winter. And then vaccines are developed to address those particular strains. We need to do the same here. Um, and uh, Brian's right that mRNA is highly um, uh, efficient at just updating it. So you provide you know the sequence, you then can just make your mRNA um, a sequence to suit that particular uh, new mutant. Uh, it's also true actually for adenoviral. I mean, it's true for all of them. It's just some of them are slower to scale up and manufacture. In the case of proteins, you've got to build the plasmids and you've got to then express them and it, it just takes a bit longer. Um, but but the goal, obviously, is to be able to pivot quickly and um, the regulators. So in this case, it, in our country, it's the MHRA, so the Medical and Health Products um, Agency. So they are responsible for defining whether or not these vaccines or medicines are safe and effective. And um, our expectation um, is that they will be able, they will start um, approving these tweaked viruses based on uh, some safety data, but much, much less um, large phase three studies because those have largely been, th those have been done. And so actually, if you're just making a small tweak, provided you can demonstrate that the safety is still, is still there, you don't then need to, to redo the whole caboodle so of the huge, big efficacy studies again. How quickly can you do that? Um, well, certainly by, um, by the coming winter. Uh, um, I don't know is the answer. Mm. Um, I mean, yet to be tested. But I think it'll be uh, weeks and months rather than several months. I mean, I think it'll be quite quick. Um, but I mean, that's all to be tested. Seb Burnside, uh, what is the, the extent of the economic upside to early vaccination um, in terms of the UK economy? Does it indicate, do you think, that there is probably going to be a mini boom this summer? But we probably won't be able to um, travel abroad, but we're also losing out on foreign tourism. It's, I mean, it's a, it's a boon, isn't it, undeniably? It's, it's certainly a huge upside to, to where we are at the moment. Um, uh, you know, we've thrown a whole manner of policies at um, uh, trying to contain the terrifying toll, frankly, of, of this virus in the last 12 months. Um, and one of those has been, uh, has been clamping down on aspects of, of the economy and people's work, which spreads, contributes to the spread of the virus. Um, now, at its lowest point, that involved in October, still 2 million people being on furlough, so being paid not to go to work. Uh, and through tighter restrictions in November, and again um, after uh, after Christmas. Now we think that number is probably uh, somewhere between uh, between four and six million. So um, we have um, been really relying on uh, some sort of 
pharmacological uh, intervention to enable us to um, have any meaningful progress back towards um, whether it's a normal or any different, um, some sort of operation uh, fundamentally of the economy. Um, and so really the whole outlook for this year um, uh, is depending upon the trajectory that the vaccination program is able to take and its effectiveness and then the really challenging still policy decisions about how you choose to unlock different aspects of our lives and society and especially difficult decisions um, uh, balancing the risks of um, uh, of, of further mutations uh, and, as you mentioned, um, uh, um, important different strains from uh, from other countries, uh, presuming that we're able to to get prevalence lower um, uh, than those countries today. So the, there's there's still lots of very difficult decisions to go um, uh, on this. And whilst we're hopeful that we will see um, a return uh, to activity. From, you know, from Easter onwards, if you like, it, I think it will be a little slower and a little more gradual and a little more cautious um, than perhaps six months ago, um, uh, people had expected, we get a vaccine, we roll it out, we're done, uh, we're back to normal. That, that doesn't feel consistent with, where, um, uh, with what, what this, this year is really going to play out. Brian, it's, it opens up, doesn't it? a whole extra layer of uh, ethical questions about science and about when is it safe to reopen? What's the balance of risk? Are we, once we're pretty much all vaccinated, are we closing the borders? Are we trying to return to normal or accepting that life is different? Are we trying to eliminate the disease uh, entirely? How do you think that will, will play out ethically? Well, um, th these aren't, scientific questions. They're questions for the interaction between scientific advice and policymakers. As you said, that there are economic, moral components to these decisions. What, what the science can do, I mean, I, I said quite early on in the pandemic, I think, on I think it was Andrew Marr, there's no such thing as this science for a start. I mean, this is a very fast moving situation. We're talking about a virus that we didn't know existed just over 12 months ago. And the, the, the key point is that what, what the science can do is, is tell you, I think Kate alluded to it, you have limited but a limited but growing data set on, on how, how effective the vaccines are, how long the immunity lasts for people who are both infected and vaccinated. These are not things that are really predictable. You have a kind of ballpark idea from previous vaccines, but you don't know. And so the, I, I think what the science can do is give you a snapshot of the best available knowledge at any given time. That's, that's all it can do. And from then on, you feed that in and it ultimately comes down to politicians to be, to be wise um, managers in a sense, or CEOs, that they, you have a panel of economists and social scientists and so on, you get the information and then the politician makes the call. And I think that's the only way it can be. How, how to what extent is this gonna change things that we're going to be alert to the to the idea that we're living potentially not just in, in in one pandemic but sort of an age of pandemics with globalization international travel just the way we've lived for the last you know 30 or 40 years arguably even 150 50 years um longer is it po is it possible for us to go back do you think maggie uh, to to the old way of living Well, we've done quite well for nine months, haven't we? <laughs> I think most of us are at the edge. Um, I think that's almost impossible to answer short term, Ian. Um, we are clearly, I mean, people have been very scared. I think probably the fear uh, inflicted on people is so big that I think people are going to be cautious for a very long time. But, uh, and you've even seen surveys of business uh, people, whether they're going to continue traveling or they got used to working from home. I think in most of these situations, it's never as dramatic as the worst forecasts and we'll find a sort of middle way. But I suspect that for several years, international travel, business travel will be, will be cut uh, mm. and reduced. 
And also, I think there's another big question to ask, and that is, if this virus sort of peters out, which one hopes, is whether it will affect how we approach global medicine generally. I mean, we've shown that the world can get together and find these incredible vaccines. Will we do that for other illnesses? Will this sort of shift thinking in, in the medical scientific world? I'd love to know what Brian thinks of that, actually. It's, uh, it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's interesting, I think, when I've you know, I've chaired debates for, I don't know, 10, 20 years, and we talk about existential risks. And they all sound science fiction and silly when you chair a panel. So there's, you know, asteroid impacts, pandemic disease, uh, AI, the threat from AI, and, thing. and it always sounds like science fiction. But of course, it isn't. They are existential risks. And, and pandemics, um, to go to your original question, you know, these are part of nature. These have happened so often i mean the last one that everyone remembers is the 1918 spanish flu pandemic but there have been others that have almost made it and not quite and so i think the answer is yes things will return to the way they were in the same way that they always have done after pandemics but the the difference is as we said before and kate said is that the the knowledge that we have generated as a result of the investment in this particular pandemic is not going to go away it is there and so it would be it would be tremendously irresponsible, I think, if we threw this opportunity, it's a, you know, an opportunity, you understand how I, I mean it, mm. threw this away, because it's clear there will be others. Um, as you said, perhaps the, the probability that you get pandemics globally is accelerating because of globalization and travel and so on. And, and now we know how to do it. Now we've developed the, 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 the vaccine technologies and the manufacturing power right to, to manufacture them in bulk i think it would be almost criminal to let that slip so i don't think it will I, i'd be interested to know what kate thinks but i don't think governments are going to forget that they have to invest in the manufacturing and the and the, and the science in in a few years or even decades it's a, it's a really good point and kate at the, the heart of what were, the work that was going on was investment in manufacturing capability walk walk us through precisely what's been done. Presumably that, that sets us up for that process you described of tweaking vaccines and manufacturing at scale and, and making vaccines for the rest of the world. So um, uh, of, the, of the goals that were set by the PM, one was to protect the UK. The second was to ensure that um, successful vaccine was distributed fairly and equitably around the world. And the third was to make sure we were better prepared for next time. So it was, it was very clear and just want to pick up on the point of future pandemics. Um, I think it's more than just globalization and, and travel. It's actually um, unsustainable agricultural practices and climate crisis. So we shouldn't get away from the fact that actually this, this is heavily man-made. And uh, so I think there is a um, political interventions around the world to figure out not that we're going to stop them, but can we slow down the rate at which these zoonotic diseases um, jump over into man and, and start creating endemic and pandemic um, crises. Um, but so then on the manufacturing, uh, the, I guess first point to make is manufacturing vaccines is no different largely from manufacturing other biological drugs. So that whether or not you're making proteins or antibodies or uh, gene therapy vectors or adenoviral vaccine vectors. They're largely similar. I mean, they are different, of course, but the tools and the equipment and the skills you need are all heavily overlapping. So we do have that capability in the UK, and that's one of the reasons um, that um, there were the, the, the Bioindustry Association pulled together a group of companies to work to support Oxford right at the beginning of the year. That started in February last year to actually start um, figuring out who was gonna do what to take the Oxford vaccine from an academic scale and, and get that up into a commercial scale that could be industrialized and manufactured but in, the, mm. in the tens of millions and hundreds of millions. Um, and so that was basically using existing resources that were there. So Cobra Biologics, which I'm sure people have talked about in, in Kiel and Oxford Biomedica, um, provided a lot of the manufacturing for the, the actual adeno vectors themselves. Um, and then, of course, you've also got fill finish. So the first part of manufacturing is to make the actual vaccine. And then the second part is to take that vaccine substance and put them in vials. 
Each of them require release testing quality, all sorts of, by law, incredibly stringent tests. And here we're talking about 10 to the 11 viral particles. So you can't be, you can't get that wrong because you don't want to be underdosing or overdosing. And it's, your, it's, it's highly complex. So just to be able to take a manufacturing process that normally takes years and years and to compress that and get to the scale we've got to in less than a year is, is off the charts. Um, astonishing. So it, it has been amazing. So our goal has basically been to ensure that the UK has that flexible manufacturing capability. And so what we've done is um, VMIC with, is the Vaccines and Manufacturing Innovation Centre. So that had already been conceptualised um, three years ago, I think. Planning permission took a while. So um, uh, part of the early manufacturing group work was to actually assess was vmic actually going to do what we needed not immediately but was it scoped um correctly and when they looked at it they saw that it actually had a manufacturing scope of three million doses and actually knowing what we know now that was insufficient so they immediately broadened that out to make that a surge manufacturing cap capability of 70 million doses which obviously is what we need and again it's flexible so it can be protein mrna um uh adeno um or potentially even antibodies so and then we bought a veterinary manufacturing plant so we got given there were all sorts of approaches and we obviously did our own survey around the uk to see what capability was out there but frankly starting from a brownfield site or even a greenfield site was going to be way too slow so we decided to buy a gmp approved veterinary manufacturing plant, which we then up, um, upgraded to uh, human GMP. Uh, and, and that's what we call CG mix. So it's based in Braintree and it's managed by the cell and gene therapy catapult. And again, cell and gene therapy products are not wildly different from, from these products. So that the, the skills needed is not hugely different. So that gives us the two capabilities to make uh, uh, everything but whole virus. Now, you have to have uber, uber contained um, facilities to grow up a pandemic virus that is lethal. So what we did with Valneva, which is a French company that has a um, facility in Livingston in Scotland, was to pay for the upgrade of their facility and, and expansion so that they could actually physically grow up SARS-CoV-2 and turn that into a vaccine. So that means now, as of today, we have three different footprints where VMIC and CGMIC um, have the ability to make all kinds of vaccine other than the whole inactivated virus. virus. And Valneva up in Scotland can do um, the whole inactivated virus. And then on top of that, there are various different other groups like the Centre of Process Innovation up in um, Darlington that is an expert in nanoparticle technology. So this is important for mRNA vaccines, which so mRNA is a tiny little sequence of genetic code. And then you basically put it in a fatty envelope. So you coat it in, in these lipid nanoparticles and that's how you stabilize it. And probably the nature of those lipid nanoparticles themselves act um, a bit as an adjuvant, as a stimulant of the immune system. So how you formulate and stabilize the mRNA is critical and CPI brings lots of those skills. So rather long-winded answer, Ian, the, we have, um, we'll have three different bulk manufacturing capabilities and we will have, we've got these various groups that bring very specific um, expertise, manufacturing expertise and formulation expertise that can be applied to the manufacture of these, um, of, of these different vaccines. But that's, you know, we're, we, we're not the whole way there yet. There are things that we need to put in place um, and be open to what are the next new emerging technologies, not necessarily um, d d different from mRNA, but how can you ideally turn mRNA into a pill? How can you turn that into a patch rather than having to be a, have a cold chain and two shots? So it's those sorts of things that we need to really focus on. And my last point is, it is very interesting that if you look at the vaccine, uh, the vaccine industry, the, the three biggest companies, which are Sanofi in France, uh, GSK here, um, and Merck in the US, none of them 
are contributing at the moment to the vaccines that are being rolled out and protecting people. Why is and, that? Well, because the innovation is coming from the little companies. So if you, and that is always what happens. Not, well, no, sorry, that's too strong. Not always what happens, but it is often what happens. And that's why it's so exciting because this is where the people and the, the companies that are really pushing back the boundaries of scientific inventiveness uh, are, are coming to the fore. And the point about this pandemic has enabled those platforms to get validated years before they might have been validated otherwise is, is really exciting. So we cannot forget how important innovation is and how important thinking outside the box and, and small companies and, and crazy ideas is to actually making step change improvements in in um, all all aspects of of my area, so whether it's vaccines or drugs, but I'm sure it applies everywhere. And so, it, nimbleness has been important the whole way through. So, um, George Trefgan asks, "What is mRNA?" He says he's asking for a history graduate friend. <laughs> okay. Um, so. I don't know how many people on the call will have done biology GCSE, but basically you've got your DNA, which is the instruction manual that defines everything in the body, not just, and, and it, that includes lots of genes. And in order to transcribe the genes, the double helix gets unwound and basically there are mirror image um, uh, uh, genetic sequences that basically reflect what's on the DNA. And that is what's called, that's called mRNA. So it stands for messenger RNA. RNA and DNA, they're just two different types of genetic code. And then that RNA is what we say the word is translated, um, but it means basically it gives the instructions to tell the cell how to turn that into a protein. And so by injecting mRNA, you're giving the cells the instructions to say, okay, we want you to transcribe this and turn this into a protein. And that protein is then the viral spike protein, which is then shown to the immune system and the immune system says, ah, oh, I now recognize this is foreign and I'm gonna develop both what's called a humoral response, which is antibody response, as well as a cellular response, which is T cells, which go in and T cells kill cells that have been infected with viruses and antibodies glom onto the um, the virus and stop that and and kill them that way. Yeah. Is that a That's sort of a one very, on one on biology? And isn't it just like crystal clear? Wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, basically, you're getting your own cells to manufacture the proteins that then stimulate your immune system to be able to protect you when the real protein or the, or the virus with that protein on comes to the body. Mm. I mean, it's a tremendously clever technology it's quite mm. wonderful but all of it so the viral so the oxford approach is the same so instead of um so in that case they have the virus that actually um gets into the cells and provides the same instructions to the cells because that's what viruses do they're not living um pathogens themselves they have to be in somebody else's cell to to actually then harness that cell's machinery to then um replicate um so it, i mean i, I do think it's um, transformational and it's the same as gene therapy where you know people have got a mutation in a certain enzyme for example um, and then you can introduce uh, a gene therapy to actually get the, the body to make the, that um, failed enzyme so that it can actually cure itself that is the ultimate direction of medicine is to use the body's exquisitely beautifully evolved ma machinery to actually uh, protect and and cure so Leslie, Leslie Smith says, dimly remember RNA and DNA from A-level. Thank you, very clear. Um, I was just going to say, it's quite interesting. Kate will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think if you look at the, the knowledge chain, so we've talked about the manufacturing change and so on, but the, the knowledge, you go back, I suppose, to things like the Human Genome Project in, in terms of being able to sequence DNA and being able to begin to understand the genetic code um, and that that was a huge, there were two investments when there was a huge investment, Clinton era, wasn't it? A big, big billion dollar mm. publicly funded project, but also Craig Venter on the private side. Uh, yeah, I, Kate. Yeah, so the Wellcome Trust funded about a third of the sequencing of the human genome. Um, and the difference was that they published the, the sequence, um, unlike private sector, which will hold on to things. And quite rightly, 
patents, you can't patent a, a gene. So you can only patent a use or a or an application in some way. Um, but but just translating the code itself doesn't tell you what those genes do or how they work or how they might be differentially spliced together to create different um, proteins and form different biological mechanisms. So it's completely required. I mean, we have to have fundamental sequencing, um, but just the sequence itself isn't enough to be able to, to really know what's going on. Seb, just on the the economic impact, we talked um, earlier about the possibility of closed borders, impacts on travel, that sort of thing. But how does this how does this play out in the global economy? Because if the UK is vaccinated and other leading um, economies are eventually vaccinated, and all uh, major countries are then on alert for mutations or for different different diseases. What does that do to things like trade patterns or or are people going to want stuff made closer to home or you know we talked about it's not it's not just business travel is it it's a whole attitude to the world so there's certainly there's certainly substantial elements which are going to change as a result of that um i think slightly surprisingly in some senses um it's shown just how dependent we are on the global supply chains um because whilst very sensibly um lots of businesses are trying to understand how to make uh, themselves more resilient um to the sorts of obstacles which um which they face at the moment and they faced during the last 12 months or so um the truth is we we do still get a tremendous amount of our um uh, goods and services from overseas and that many countries actually are doing more trade with places like china um mm -hmm. post pandemic um uh, because they've been so successful at containment that they've been able to get their um, uh, productive resources back up and actually in, in their case above where they were last year uh, and so they've been able to start supplying uh, um, uh, the rest of the world more effectively so um, the countries that have really done a great job of um, of containing the impact are, are the ones which um, stand stand best able to take advantage of that trade pattern um, but I think that's still a a relatively sort of short-term impact. Um, I was really taken by um, by Kate and, and Brian's comments about the the, the deeper sort of innovation point, um, and um, one of the longest-term benefits we could take from from this is capturing that ability to bring to market to to the masses the cutting-edge innovations um, uh, that have come from might call sort of blue sky research uh, in the relatively recent past um, because you can my favorite example of this is is back to faraday no, notionally inventing the motor in 18 electric motor in 1822 and yeah brilliant but at the end of that century 95 percent of u.s manufacturing was still using steam not electricity it was henry ford and his visionary manufacturing processes which actually enabled the unique advantages of the electric motor to be deployed to masses and then we got you know, 20 30 years of unbelievable productivity growth which made the world better off as a result of it developed world at that point anyway and um, and so i think the echoes of that with the speed with which um uh, with which case um, has articulated that we've been able to bring new platforms uh, into the market for something so critical as um as healthcare uh, i think you know capturing capturing that spirit and those advancements is um uh, it will be what matter when we look back at this you know decades in the future hopefully yeah, a very good example of that would be would be uh, antibiotics. I mean, penicillin. Um, I remember talking to a historian about this. It was about was it 1928, I think, that it was discovered, uh, and even before that was kind of suspected. Um, but actually, you don't see it really distributed until after the Second World War. Probably, and actually, the Second World War drove that innovation. It took decades to go from the discovery of the first antibiotic to it really anybody using it. Um, and yeah. So that, yeah, no, very good point. Linda uh, Beskin uh, asks, Kate, is this rapid development of virus immunology uh, technology likely to bring advances in, ca in cancer treatments, the sort of the spirit of innovation? Yes, because what, what we're doing with vaccines 
is uh, stimulating stimulating the body's uh, immune system to control and eliminate a invading pathogen. Um, cancer is a failure of the immune system. So if you think about the millions of cells that are floating around your body, basically surveying to say, are there some foreign cells coming into the body or are some of the cells um, going wrong? In which case, that's what our immune system does is to take them out. And uh, so cancer is a failure of the immune system. So is there a way that these sorts of vaccines can be used ahead of a diagnosis, for example, to stimulate a body's immune system? So it could be, I mean, I'm being very blue sky now, but it could be in your middle age, when you hit 45 or 50 or whatever, you go in for your, um, your, your checkup and they say, right, we're gonna give you vaccinations against the top five cancers and we will stimulate your body's immune system because we know enough I'm still being blue sky here, but we will know enough about what the, the drivers or the, the markers are of those different cancers such that we can um, induce your immune response to absolutely be on special lookout for those ones so that we can start trying to focus healthcare on wellness and prevention of disease rather than trying to deal with the, the symptoms and the consequences of the disease once, once they've happened. So going back to your question, brilliant question. And immunology, I think, is absolutely the fundamental basis of how we're going to change medicine around the world. So we've got uh, lots of response, well, loads, loads and loads of questions, but we've got uh, lots of people basically just saying thank you. Um, I think Chris, Chris Masterson captures it best. Uh, so I just want to thank Kate and her team for such a great performance. Uh, thousands of us, if, if not millions of us, will are alive to the incredible performance in coloring the right vaccine strategies. Um, so people are people are really grateful. Really good um, questions from Robert Fox, who writes um, brilliantly for Reaction. And you've got three very good journalistic questions, but how and why did Kate go about her communication strategy for the vaccination came, uh, campaign? What was the aim and how was it uh, achieved? And then he also asks, what about the use of the armed forces um, in, the, in, in, in the vaccination rollouts and track and trace? Were they a help uh, or a hindrance? Does this need to be formalized beyond present civil contingency legislation? Um, so communications, um... Uh, on our side um, was used to create and to launch the NHS vaccine registry. So if I just go back again, um, once we'd identified which were the most promising vaccines, our goal was to make sure that we got uh, the clinical and safety data as soon as we could to say, did these vaccines work? So one of the slow parts of running clinical studies historically has been the bureaucracy and getting the approvals and the red tape and all of that. And brilliantly basically bureaucracy just went out of the window all the all the approvals still you still had to go through the approvals but they were instead of scheduling them every other month they were scheduled immediately so the bureaucracy was pushed aside the um the the manufacturing uh risk of of scale up um before you know whether or not the vaccine works that was um, pushed aside because we had the money to basically take that risk and, and invest in manufacturing. So the one thing we had to do was to figure out how are we gonna test whether or not these vaccines actually work and are they safe? And so the single biggest uh, slow part of running trials is literally getting the people into the trials. And what was important, of course, is we needed to make sure that the people who are most at risk of, of COVID um, infection were the ones who were in the trials. Because no point having a vaccine that works beautifully on a 25 year old if it didn't affect and, and protect an 80 year old. So we launched for the first time, it's never been done in the world before, a citizen registry. So anybody in the UK was able to go onto the NHS website and sign up and say, I would like to learn about how I can participate in clinical trials. It didn't commit you to doing it, but at least you'd, um, as and when a clinical trial came along, you would then get an email saying, this is one for which you might be eligible. And so what it enabled us to do was as part of our UK offer to the different vaccine companies around the world, we could say, 
not only have we put in plans placed plans to support you on manufacturing and fill finish if that's what you need but we can also commit that we can run these studies quickly for you and the uk is really good we've got national um, clinical trial set units all over the, the country um but with the registry we have people so we could say you know uh if they come to us and they say we want a third of our uh trial cohort to be over the age of 60 um we can then go to the registry and we ping the people over the age of 60 and a third of the people of the nearly 400,000 people that said that signed up are over the age of 60 so that worked so the purpose of the communications was to tell people that this is what we were putting in place this this uh, this vaccine register or oh, nhs registry um, and to say, please, will you sign up so that we can get the trials enrolled quickly? And the proof was uh, came through last week with Novavax, because this is a US company. They came to the UK to start their phase uh, three study. They'd been running a phase two B in South Africa. They started with an expectation that they wanted to recruit 10,000 people, which is a big study. They then halfway through said, you know what, we'd like to recruit 15,000. This is going really well. And we were able to recruit 15,000 people, including whatever it was, significant proportion elderly, um, within two months. And we completed the recruitment before they'd even started their trial in the US. So that just gives you a flavor of what we were doing to try and make sure that we could get those answers quickly um, for then MHRA to then assess whether or not the vaccine was safe and effective. And we did that through the registry. Now, um, that is something that you need specialist communication support for. So there's, I can't do that. We need, we need, and there's, you know, it's not the, the purview of a government press office either. So uh, that's why we had to go around and tell people what the vaccines are, how they work, that you need, you know, this is how clinical trials work. These are why we need to have people at risk enrolling in clinical trials. So it's those sorts of messages um, that we needed to communicate to in order to do this for what was, again the first time ever done and and frankly i think it's been a big success really good uh technical question from uh jerry malone a former minister of health and and uh, also passes on his congratulations stunning success of the vaccine program probably the most rapid and successful deployment of a mass immunization program anywhere ever and that's someone who who, who knows the who knows the nhs and the department of health well he says the rapid rollout of vaccines plus all the the data capturing abilities that you've just described surely it offers the uk the opportunity to conduct the biggest long-term randomized clinical trial in medical history on this question of second doses sort of three is that happening that they're that they will measure who's had their dose after three weeks, 12 weeks, or even, even longer. As he, sa as he says, it may turn out that longer is better. Well, longer is likely to be better. I mean, of course, the debate has been, uh, given that the Pfizer uh, trial is only, only assessed three weeks, how could we be doing more? But in Im immunology, three weeks is the shortest possible period in order that you need to mount an immune response. So quite rightly given that speed was the essence that was the the time that was chosen between the two doses because it was the shortest possible period therefore you could get to protection in the shortest possible period if you had a three-week interval between doses but it's well understood uh in vaccines now that i've learned something about it and spoken to a lot of experts um that actually if you extend the time between dosing you actually improve the immune response and in the way that the oxford study was designed in part deliberate partly deliberately and partly because things didn't quite pan out as expected they were able then to show that actually by extending the um the, the, the time between shots you could actually in, enhance the immunity so oxford was originally designed as a single shot vaccine and when they saw their early phase two date it was very clear that doing that second jab actually improved immune response so then they had to go back to all the people who thought they were only getting one shot and bring them back and that's why they have a whole spectrum of people who've had second jabs with different um periods between the two shots so um yes i mean i think uk is beautifully positioned to do all those studies but brian we're, we're coming towards the end just time for a couple more questions but i just wanted to ask you about the question of 
where science sits in the in the in the in the national debate we've been arguing about this in britain you know since the 1950s and 60s the idea of two cultures that science is is a part and we don't take science quite you know seriously it's not taken seriously enough um uh, in the corridors of power but i mean it turns out we're actually really rather good at it yeah i mean the very brief answer is that our university system is a uh, arguably i suppose second only to the united states and um actually i say arguably because it's more efficient i think if you look dollar for dollar investment we we we, we punch way above our own number one um and but what i would say is that that rests on a heritage it rests on many many centuries actually of science and it's um i, I always say when when i get invited to say anything to the government it's um it is rather easier to damage than it is to build you, you see countries like china trying to build large science bases and it's extremely expensive and extremely difficult takes a long time um so yeah i i think we we are i would say world leading um and then the, the question then becomes what do we want to do with it i think i you know it, it's all it's often or it's been the case for a long time that, as Kate said, it's that translation of the knowledge into economic activity, into the into the breakthroughs and large scale manufacturing and so on, that perhaps we're, we're not as good at. But even then, I think often that's uh, overstated. So I think it's a success story. I think we're very good at it. We have a tremendous foundation. It's something that, you know, we the more we invest, I think, the the, the larger the return will be. Yeah, Maggie and Seb, just final question. It, it, it's a, it is a boost for national morale, isn't it? After a you know, pretty terrible start to the pandemic and uh, death toll and, uh, and a really difficult few years. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just go ahead. Okay. Um, and just picking up on Brian's point, I mean, in a sense, it's no accident that we've been so good at the development of the rollout because our life science industry is just so successful. And that's been a most brilliant collaboration, in fact, between government, between universities, and indeed the NHS and the clinical trials that we can do within a centralized health service. And indeed, Sir John Bell's um, life science industrial strategy was way ahead. Um, and I think that's a fantastic, um, a fantastic example of what we've been able to do. What I'd love to hear very quickly from Brian and Kate is what more could we do? Do we, is, where is our lack? Is it the youngsters going into science? Do we still need to make it more exciting? I mean, people like you, Brian, and now Kate, you will make it more exciting. Um, but is there more that we can do at school? Because I think it's probably at the bottom end that we need to keep this fantastic success story going. Yeah. Let's just oh, get... Sure, is the answer. We need, we absolutely need to get more people going to science. We need to get more women in, and girls into science, and we need to explain why it's interesting. So I sort of fell into science because I wasn't particularly focused, and eventually was told, "Well, can you do science?" I said, "Okay, I can." And then I really got into it and loved it. And it's when you can. And so it started off. You know, we used to make makeup in the chemistry lab. So I used to make lipstick and eyeshadow and mascara and stuff. And that was kind of cool when you're a teenager. Um, and and then when you start to understand how the stuff you're learning in a textbook actually translates into changing people's lives, such as we've seen with vaccines. Actually, what's not to like? You're pushing back the, the, the ultimate fundamental basis of science to understand what are the drivers and mechanisms of disease, and then thinking about, in my job, how can you actually intervene in those, those disease-causing mechanisms to actually either save lives or control disease and um, Im improve the quality of life and, and economic wealth of everybody and the answer is it's possible and it's fun and you're only dealing with amazing people and this is not getting up each morning you know and you're bored about what your job is it is constantly stimulating and interesting and that is what i think needs to be um that message needs to get through to schools and anybody who's like a bit like me i you know i could have done geography i, I could have done all sorts of things eventually somebody said okay you're doing science and it was the best push i've ever had ever Let's come to let, let's come to Seb for a final word, and then Brian finally on on science. But Seb, what what do we need to be doing as a country um, to to exploit this advantage? I, mean, I think um, you know, we've certainly got a generation of school children whose experience is 
for such a high proportion of their um, uh, of their lives have been so fundamentally disrupted by this um, that hopefully many will take that as an inspiring um, uh, uh, inspiring experience to see the impact that can have. Um, I think that um, I think there will be a somewhat reevaluation in terms of um, uh, what support goes in and uh, how we fund our university sector to um, uh, to provide the education um, uh, to allow people to pursue those those dreams and those careers. It frankly costs a lot more to train a scientist than an economist. Uh, and uh, many universities have understood that um, when um, when they've been trying to balance the books over recent years. So, um, yeah, hopefully that will uh, see some addressing. Well, we, we need economists as well. Brian, what should we be doing? Uh, I mean, I, I thought Kate answered it very well. I mean, the, the part of it is the the inspirational element. Um, but then I, I think that's that's there. And, and as Kate had said, it, it, this experience, people have seen science in action. I think that I think there will be an increase in, in students wanting to do science. Um, and then, as Seb said, I think the key point then is, is how do you fund it? How do you make sure that, that, that there's creativity in the research sector? I think that my personal perspective is that through my 25 years or so in, in, in science in universities, uh, I've seen a, a less. It's become harder for the for the for the for the creative scientists to, to function, that there are very big sort of programs that you can go into and, and, and we tend to direct research funding sometimes into things that are fashionable at one particular time or other. And what you see time and again is that serendipity is extremely important in research. So, so I think it's those things, but it's, it, it, there's no easy answer. I mean, the, the key, you know, education and research and science are vital for a 21st century economy and they are expensive and they require investment and uh, how we do it is perhaps one for the politicians and the economists but what I can say is that <laughs> it's a tremendously valuable and essential thing to do. Yeah well thank you very much to all of our guests this evening Kate Bingham, Brian Cox, Maggie Pagano, Seb uh, Burnside. Uh, Answer Time is the discussion show produced by the team at Reaction it's in association with NatWest Group. Thank you very much for joining. If you're not a subscriber to Reaction, but you're watching this, I can't believe you're not a subscriber to Reaction, but go to the site and uh, join up and get all of our journalism. Thank you very much for joining us.